Good evening. I, I usually speak to young people, so <laughs> if I do that a few times, then just go with me. Um, evening to everyone online as well. Give us a thumbs up or a like or a heart, whatever you do online. So I just want to introduce, um, actually I'll introduce the band first, because you should probably think of who the heck are these random people on the stage. So this is Ryan, give everyone a wave. Hello. This is Ryan. Hello. Julia, give everyone a wave. <laughs> Gareth, is, is that the right yeah. Gareth. <laughs> And then Peter Galloway, give everyone a wave. Um, Ryan and Julia go to, um, well, I, you know, um, Peter and Gareth and myself, we are from CFC, um, and Andrew and we're just the wider CFC family. CFC is Christian Fellowship Church, um, if you know of it. But I'll introduce myself um, before we get into the word. You just want to know about me, or do you know who he is now? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll introduce myself, I don't know what that was. So my name is um, Peter, um, I am 26 years old. Um, I'm married to Megan. Megan's not here tonight. I think she's watching online. I hope. <laughs> no. Um, I, I currently live in Doak. Who knows where Doak is? No. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone. Um, I'm moving to Ballyclare. Bought a house in Ballyclare. Moving on Friday. Woo. So yeah, moving house on Friday. Um, I work for a company called Green Construction. Um, I'm a CAD technician. I'm not going to bore you this time with what my job is and what I do. Um, I go to CFC in Antrim. Um, I lead some youth ministry in Bally San Nilam, along with William McCourney. Um, yes, everyone's looking at William McCourney like youth in Bally San. There is youth here, by the way, and we've got some young people here tonight. It is great to have you. Um, so yes, tonight I'm just going to pray, and then we're going to get into the word. Who's up for the word tonight? Amen. Sure. Everyone, most people here. Yeah. Let's pray. So Father God, I thank you tonight that you're here, and that you're moving. Father God, I thank you tonight. And for your word, I thank you that you've given it to us, Father God, we can study and we can come around it tonight. Father God, I pray that you give me boldness, give me courage, give me confidence, Father God, to, to proclaim your word tonight. So Father God, I pray that you just come and move by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' precious name, when we all say it. Amen. 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 So I want to speak on um, something tonight that God has put on my heart a long time ago. And I believe it's for now, I believe it's for today, I believe it's for... I believe it's for everyone else if you don't come here. Um, I have entitled this tonight, What or Who is on the Throne of Your Heart? What or Who is on the Throne of Your Heart? And for a base scripture tonight, if you have your Bible, I might going to read from Jeremiah chapter 2, so the Old Testament, book of Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 4 down to 13. But before we go there, um, we will get there in a minute before you start booing me and tell me to get off the stage um, for not reading the scriptures. Before we get there, um, I want to ask you this question. And I want you to think in your mind, don't answer out loud, just think in your mind. If someone says to you, what does the heart, H-E-A-R-T, heart, what does the heart look like? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Just have a think. Someone says heart to you. H-E-A-R-T, heart. <coughs> Have we all got something? Yeah. Heart. So we can either go in two directions, mostly. Some of you would probably like to be like, oh, I didn't go that way. But with this, I think this is what happens in our heads. Firstly, we either go to, we think of a heart-shaped symbol. Did anyone think of a heart-shaped symbol when I said, yep, yep, yeah, this is good. Um, I think of a heart-shaped symbol, so if you have a, a modern mobile phone, there's like a hundred heart-shaped symbols, like emojis. Like they're not just red hearts, one of the days of red hearts. We've got all sorts of shapes of hearts and sizes of hearts. And if you have a, if, you, if you're in a card to someone, a greetings card, you might draw a wee heart. See when I write Megan a, a, a card, I would write to Megan, heart, from Peter, heart. How romantic am I? <laughs> so that's the first way that people can go. The second way that people can go, and you went all scientific on me. Who went scientific? Who thought about the heart pumping blood around your body? Yeah, the rest of you just didn't do anything. <laughs> but yes, I'm glad, I'm glad some of you just went that way. You, you thought of the scientific heart, the, the biological heart. You thought of the aorta and the pulmonary artery and the atrium. I sound smart, but I Googled it. <laughs> but tonight, I'm not going to give you an art lesson tonight on how to draw heart shapes. Because if anyone knows me, my art is literally awful. Like it is horrendous. 
I don't even know if I could draw a heart shape. Megan looks at this um, shape and she's like, what the heck's that? Um, but I'm not going to give a science lesson or a biology lesson tonight either because I failed that in school, so let's not go there. Um, but tonight I want to, to look at what the biblical idea of the heart is and who is sitting on the throne of the, your heart. You know, here's a fun fact. Fun fact Friday, well, it's Sunday, but we'll go with that anyway. <laughs> In the, in the Bible, there are over 800 verses in Scripture that mention this word, heart. 826 to be exact. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, that is quite a lot. Actually, it is a lot. But I couldn't help think, but God, God wasn't talking about, or the people writing the Scriptures weren't talking about a heart-shaped symbol, nor were they talking about a biological heart. So what, what, is, meant, what is meant by, what is referred to, when the word heart is said in the word. So let's read all 800. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but let me just read a few um, scriptures. If, if you're an unreal flicking through the Bible, you might want to follow, but just probably aren't. No, that's probably offensive, but hey, well. Psalm 51 10 says this Create in me a clean heart, O God. Psalm 44 21 says, For he knows the secret of every heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 to 10 says, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things. I'm desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. Matthew 6 and 21 says, Wherever your, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Matthew 22 and 37, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God of all your heart, soul, and mind. Romans 10 and 10 says, For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. I've nearly finished, by the way, with these scriptures. 2 Corinthians 9 and 7 says, You must each decide in your heart how much you give. Matthew 15 and 18 to 19 says, The words you speak from your heart. But the words you speak come from your heart. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. See, when we read them scriptures, we get a clear picture that God is not speaking about a, a symbol, nor is he speaking about a biological heart that is pumping blood around our body. If we take it literal, I actually laughed myself when I was preparing this. If you take a literal and you think of the heart as it's pumping blood around your body, and that's what God is talking about, it says in Matthew 12 and 43, for whatever is in your heart determines what you say. See, if we take a literal, we'd all be walking around going, boom, 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 boom. Do, do we do that? Well, if you do, then maybe go and see some. <laughs> so that's not what God is clearly talking about and the other writers are referring to. So I said to God, well, what are you actually referring to when the word heart is, um, is mentioned in the word? And he showed me this picture, and I'm going to try my best to explain it to you. I believe the biblical idea of the heart is something like this. You can liken the biblical idea of the heart to a control room or a command center. If you think about a control room at say for example an airport see the people behind the desks or behind the screen of the airport they're not literally out on the airfield <clears throat> they're sitting behind something and they're giving direction they're giving guidance to pilots pilots on the ground when can they take off when can they land they're giving direction to the pilots in the sky whether they can come down whether it's safe to do so they're giving direction to pilots maybe in the sky. They need to circle a few times before they can land because they can't come into the airport right now. See, this is the biblical idea of the heart. From a it controls. From it, let me go again. The, the control room controls from the inside what happens on the outside. The control room controls from the inside what happens. On the outside, this is the biblical idea of the heart. Whatever is going on in your heart is displayed in the physical. See, the heart controls your thoughts. The heart controls your feelings. 
The heart controls your emotions, your conscience, your character, your intellect, your will. That's what the human, that's what the biblical heart does. That's why the scriptures say, for whatever is in your heart determines what you say. The scriptures also say, you must each decide in your heart how much you give. Rivers of living water will flow from his heart. So the heart, whatever is happening in here, whatever is happening in here, is displayed in the physical. Let me suggest this tonight. Maybe you struggle with outbursts of anger. We don't want to hear it sometimes. We don't like to hear it, but it starts in the heart. So with the understanding of the heart as a control room, like that idea, with the understanding of whatever is going on in the heart is displayed in the physical, we must acknowledge this, and it's the title of my message tonight. We must acknowledge that there is a seat on the throne of our heart. There is a seat in the middle of our heart. There is someone or there is something giving guidance, giving direction, giving instruction, um, speaking wisdom into your life. So I ask you the question tonight, church. What or who is on the throne of your heart? Can I say this and can I suggest this? That seat in the middle of your heart is reserved for one person and one, per one person alone, and that is God. That is God. God made you. God knows you best. He, he loves you. He cares for you. He is looking after you. The earth and everything in it is his. That seat is reserved for him. But the sad thing came in Genesis when the fall of man happened. Human beings started to put this thing called idols on the throne of their heart. They started putting other things on the throne of their heart. They started letting other people and other things control their thoughts, control their feelings, control their emotions, control their character, control their will, control their intellect. Why would we want anyone or anything else sitting on the throne of our hearts when God knows us best, when God is looking after us, when God is caring for us? Why would we want anyone else on that throne? God made it very clear, very, very clear, that that throne is reserved for him and for him alone. Who remembers the Ten Commandments? Yeah, I think we all do. The first commandment is this, found in Exodus 20, um, verses 3 to 4. You must have no other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind, of any image in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, I am a jealous God. I will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. Who or what is sitting on the throne of your heart tonight? And I ask the question to those sitting in the room and to those online tonight. Who or what is sitting on the throne of your heart? Now let's get to the scriptures. Jeremiah. Chapter 2, verses um, 4 to 13. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Listen to the word of the Lord, people of Jacob, all you families of Israel, this is what the Lord says. What did your ancestors find wrong with me that led them to stray so far from me? They worship worthless idols, not only to become worthless themselves, they did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us safely out of Egypt and led us to the barren wilderness, a land of deserts and pits, a land of drought and death where no one lives or even travels. And when I brought you into a fruitful land to enjoy its bounty and goodness, you defied my land and corrupted the possession I had promised you. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who taught my word ignored me. The rulers turned against me. The prophets spoke in the name of Baal, wasting their time on worthless idols. Therefore, I will bring my case against you, says the Lord, 
I will even bring charges against your children's children in the years to come firsthand. Go west and look in the land of Cyprus. Go east and search to the land of Kedar. Has anyone ever seen or heard of anything as strange as this? Has any nation ever traded its gods for new ones, even though they are not gods at all? Yet, my people, yet my people have exchanged their glorious God or their glory for worthless idols. Remember that first, folks. Yet my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. The heavens are shocked at such a thing and shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord. Verse 13. For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. What a very sad first scripture. You know, this is, I'm not going to go into all the, the details about this time because I really don't feel I have to. But this is um, God giving the young prophet Jeremiah a message about the people of Israel. God's chosen people. And within the scriptures, he says things like this. They worshipped worthless idols. They have ignored me. They have turned against me. They have traded me for other gods. And they've done all this even though I protected them. They've done all of this even though I provided for them. Let me suggest this tonight. These people, they removed God from the throne of their hearts and it was evident. And it was evident. Because when you start putting other things on the throne of your heart, when you start putting idols on the throne of your heart, there is evidence and it's not good evidence. And God sees it. God sees it. These people put something or someone else in the place of God. First hand, basically what that's saying, it's, it's saying, as far as the east is from the west, this is happening everywhere. This is not just confined to one place. There's people everywhere. All Most God's people are putting other things and other people on the throne of their heart. They're removing God. They're worshipping worthless idols. They're putting other things on the place where God should be. And God basically says to Jeremiah, well, this is strange. Well, this is odd. Why would my people do this? Then he asks in verse 11, Do you know of any other nation who abandons their God for another worthless one? I was thinking about this. Do I know of any other, other religion who trades their gods for other ones? I'm not sure I do. But some Christians, and I'll get to that in a minute, some Christians have treated their glorious God for worthless idols. Let me remind you tonight, if you're a Christian in this room, if you're born again, if you're a follower of Christ, whatever terminology you want to use, you'll, you know that you're a Christian. Let me remind you of this, you might be an Israelite, but you're chosen by God. 1 Peter 2 and 9 says that you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. And you are God's very own possession. So yes, you might be reading that scripture and say, well, I'm not an Israelite. I don't live in Israel. God was talking about his chosen people. And we, as Christians tonight, if you're a Christian, you are God's chosen people tonight. So this, this does... Um, apply to us just as much as it did back then. Verse 13, and I'll, I'll spend a bit of time on this. It says, um, For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. They have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no <coughs> water at all. First thing, the evil that God says his people have done, they have abandoned me. The fountain of living water. What is the fountain of living water? It is the Spirit of God. That is the fountain of living water. Basically, they abandon God Himself. See, the fountain of living water is clean. 
The fountain of living water is good for you. The fountain of living water doesn't leave you thirsty. The fountain of living water doesn't leave you wanting. The fountain of living water satisfies, sustains, and brings freedom. But these people abandon all of that. And they dug for themselves crack cisterns. The crack cisterns is essentially, I see it as a metaphor for idols. Crack cisterns contain dirty water, diseased water. It is unclean. It will leave us sick. It will leave us needing. It will leave us wanting. It doesn't satisfy. But these people, God's chosen people, say, well, God, I'm turning my back on you, and I'm going to go after this. C.S. Lewis said this, idols have the habit of destroying those who entertain them. Cracked cisterns or dirty water, and it will destroy you physically if you drink from that. But idols will destroy our soul. Idols will destroy our heart. Idols will destroy our testimony. Idols are God substitutes. As I said, that seat on the throne of your heart is reserved for him and for him alone. Amen. Because we are created to let God have his way in our lives because his way is the best way. Let me back that up with some scripture tonight. Isaiah 55, 8 to 9. My thoughts are nothing like yours, says the Lord. My ways are far beyond anything that you can imagine. Right. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God's way is the best way, church. God's way is the best way. When we remove God from the throne of our heart, it, it's not left unoccupied. We will allow something else to take that place. And I'll say this with boldness tonight. I believe that there's some people in this room and watching online Yes, you're a Christian. Yes, you're born again. Yes, you're a follower of Christ. Whatever it may be, whatever terminology you want to use. I'm not disputing that tonight. Please hear my heart. I'm not disputing that tonight. But I believe that there are people in this room and online. And God is not on the throne of your heart, Christian. You are being di directed. You're being guided. You're being instructed. You're being given wisdom. You're being given counsel by something else or someone else that you think is better than God. You're running to someone else instead of running to God. But that seat's reserved for him. Have you dug for yourself a crack sister that can hold no water at all? When we think of idols, we might think of things, standard addictions like drugs and alcohol and pornography and all of that sort of stuff. Yes, they are idols. Absolutely they are. But can I suggest tonight that idols are not bad things in themselves? This is what I mean by the, the, that statement. We can actually make idols of the blessings that God has given us. We can put the blessing on the throne of our instead of the blesser. We can put the blessings instead of the blesser. It might look a bit like this in our lives. God has blessed you with money. I think we all like money, don't we? Put your hand up your money. Yeah. <laughs> God has blessed us with money to pay our bills, to feed our families, to put clothes on our back. Whatever it may be. But you, you've put money on the throne of your heart. You might be in a job and you might think, I need a bit more money. So I need that promotion. You don't deserve that promotion. You don't have qualifications for that promotion. So you start to lie about it. Some things, you go to your boss and say, bump me up here, I need more money, I need that promotion. You forgot about God says that he will look after you, he looks after the, the, the lilies in the field, so he'll look after you. That's right. You might think, well, the prices are going up today, you have the petrol and the food and all the rest of it, so I'm going to go and lie about um, my qualifications and all the rest of it to get more money. That's pretty money on the throne of your heart. Maybe you have to use the benefit system in Northern Ireland and you get what you deserve. 
but money's in the throne of your heart. So you start filling out forms, and you start lying on forms to get more money. That's an idol, and it needs to go tonight. God has blessed you with a, a wonderful family. Maybe it might be a husband, a wife, kids, mom, dad, whatever it may be. You know, you can make your family an idol because you can spend more time with them than you do with God. And you run after them instead of running after God. You start missing regular prayer times. You start missing church. You start missing reading the word of God because well, my family need me, absolutely they do, and go and meet their needs. But surely God should come first. Surely God should come first. Maybe you have to get up an hour earlier in the morning to spend time with God before you run after your family. Do that. If you don't, then family are on the throne of your heart and it needs to go. Idols can take the form of, in many ways, success. The desire to be popular or liked. There's nothing wrong with success. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be liked. But when it, when it comes um, number one in your life, it needs to go. And I'll say this because I believe it's very relevant for today. I believe over the last year and a half or 20 months or whatever it's been with the whole pandemic thing, I believe that many Christians have put up good two sides, so not cause an issue. Um, I believe that many Christians have put conspiracy theories in the throne of their heart. What do I mean by that? Instead of opening the word and seeing what God says, you go onto Google and type in COVID-19 conspiracy theories, and you believe that over you believe the word of God. That starts controlling your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, your character, your intellect, and your will. And the Bible's out the window because conspiracy theorist says this. I can't even say that word. That's how much I know about conspiracy theories. Or we go the other way. And we read BBC News. And we believe everything BBC News says. We fear everything BBC News says. And we read that. We get our phones out. We get our iPads out. We read that instead of reading the word of God, where, say, where God says, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and a sound mind. But BBC News says, all these cases, blah, blah, blah. I'm not saying don't trust them, but I'm saying don't fear tonight. I'm saying if you need to turn it off tonight, and you don't go and watch the news tonight, go and open the word tonight. Amen. Because... If, if that's the case and BBC's here and conspiracy theories are here, they need to go and be switched off, they need to be stopped in your life. I heard this anonymous quote. It's anonymous, so I'll take it. Our location in the Word, or our location is the Word, but we must not be informed by the Word. Our location is the Word, but we must not be informed by the Word. Pastor and author Rich Philodas said this. The sad irony of our day is that we can be deeply committed to being a Christian, but not deeply committed to Christ. Wow. We can be deeply committed to being a Christian, but not deeply committed to Christ. What does it mean to be deeply committed to Christ? He sits on the throne of your heart, no one else. He sits on the throne of your heart, nothing else. Jeez. God is calling you back, Christian. He's calling you back to put him on the throne of your heart tonight. Julie, mm -hmm. can't see John, please. So saying all of this, talking about the heart, talking about idols, doesn't really matter who is on the throne of your heart. Well, I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. Doesn't matter. I believe it does matter. I believe so much it matters. If you have your Bible, I'm going to read a couple of verses of Scripture. Ezekiel chapter 14, if you want to turn with me. If you don't, it's okay. Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 1 to 4, says this. Then some of the leaders of Israel 
visited me, talking about visiting the sick young. And while they were sitting with me, this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, these leaders have set up idols in their hearts. They have embraced things that will make them fall into sin. Why should I listen to their request, says God? Wow. These people have set up idols on the throne of their heart. And God says, why should I listen to their requests? I'll get back to that in a minute. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and restore their lives. In 2 Chronicles, there are conditions set out for God's people. For you and for me. People might say, well this isn't for today. It is very much for today, church. And God says there's four conditions in order to see me move. There's four conditions in order to see revival. There's four conditions in order to see healing taking place. There's four, there's four conditions in order to see your family saved. And they're this. Humble ourselves, pray, seek God's face, and turn from your wicked ways. I can't help but wonder this, church. I believe the church isn't too bad, honestly, isn't too bad at the whole humbling process. I believe when we humble, okay. I believe that the church, there's a lot of prayer goes on in church, individually, as corporate galleries. I believe that we seek the face of God. But I can't help but wonder this, have we missed the part where God says you must turn from your wicked ways? There's four conditions that we have to meet and honestly, I believe this with all of my heart. We have missed the part where God says, turn from your wicked ways. Idols on the throne of your heart. Whether we, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for me to say, but idols are wicked. And they need to go from our lives. We pray, God, send revival. But we have family sitting on the throne of our heart. We pray, God, would you save my, my brothers, my sisters, my mom, my dad, my grandkids, whatever it may be. But we have money sitting on the throne of our heart. We pray, God, would you heal whoever it may be. But conspiracy theories are number one in our heart. Are we ever going to see revival? Are we ever going to see people healed? like we want to? Are we, ever, are we ever going to see people saved and set free from the bondage of sin in, like, in a way that God wants to? Because he wants to save everyone. Are we ever going to see any of that if we don't turn from our wicked ways, church? I pray every single day for revival. But here's a confession from the front. I've got other people and other things in the throne of my heart sometimes. And I wonder why God doesn't answer because he says there's four conditions. Yes, I, I humble myself. Yes, I pray. I seek his face. But there's a wicked way in me. Who is sitting on the throne of your heart tonight? What do you want to see God do in your family? What do you want to see God do in your body? Or the, or the bodies of your family members? Can I suggest tonight that you go, or not even go, right, right now, we search our hearts and we say, God, what is and who is sitting on the throne of our hearts? So why does it matter? Why does it matter? Because we've got family members going to hell. We've got family members and friends who are sick. So why does it matter that we've got wicked ways in our hearts? Why does it matter that we've got idols on our hearts? One of my best friends, and he's been a best friend, he might be watching tonight if he is, God bless. He's, he's not saved. And I pray, God, would you save him when I have other things in the throne of my heart? And I expect God to, to answer them. Maybe God is saying to us tonight, why should I listen to their requests? Wow, that's humble, isn't it? Bally's telling me, let me ask you a question. What do you desire to happen in this place? 
Do you know my desire for you as a church? That every single generation after generation will be sitting in these seats Sunday morning, Sunday evening under the sound of the gospel. The men, women, boys and girls are being saved and set free from the bondage of sin. That's my desire for you as a church. But are we, are you ever going to see it? Are we ever going to see it? When we have other things in the thrones of our heart. I fear that we won't. I fear that you won't. And it's, it's taken, honestly, it's taken so much for me to share this message tonight. I would, I would have loved to come and encourage you with a, a lovely, encouraging word. Honestly, but I must be obedient to the word of God. I must be obedient to what God spoke to me. So I say to you tonight, actually I don't say to you, God says to you tonight, if God is not on the throne of your heart, sort it out, change it before him tonight. And I'm sorry if this isn't what you want to hear tonight. This isn't what I exactly want to preach tonight. <laughs> no my heart. But I really want to see a revival. I really want to see a revival. I I read of revivals of the past. I read of revivals of old. I want to stop reading about revivals. And I want to see a revival. I want to be in a revival. I want to pray for people on their hate. And I want to pray for people and they're set free. Amen. The revival of birth, the Eden of church that we're in tonight, 101 years ago, that was a revival. Lord, do it again. Lord, do it again. But he's calling us to turn from our wicked ways. Back to you, Lord I can't preach this message tonight and ask those in this room who are not Christians. I can't ask, I can't preach this message and just leave it there. If you're not a Christian in this room, I know that God is not on the throne of your heart. I know that God is not the king of your life. I know that God is not. If you're not a Christian in this room, would you come to God tonight? Would you come to him tonight? Would you say, come and take your place on the throne of my heart? Would you say, God, I want to live for you? Would you say, God, I want to give you everything? God, I want you to be the one who's the source of my wisdom. I want you to be the one, the source of my knowledge. I want you to be the one who, who fills me, who fills my mind with, with, um, with good things, with God things, with things that will change your family, things that will change this nation. So church, maybe you'll close your eyes in this moment. And I'm going to ask a question to two groups of people. The first, first is non-Christians. Maybe you're not a Christian in this room and you know tonight that God is not on the throne of your heart. You know that you're living a, a, a different way and you know that God should be there on the throne of your heart in your life. You need to be born again. With every eye closed in this room, I ask that you would just put your hand up if you want to come to God tonight for the first time or if you're back then come back then stick your hand up I'll see it I'll speak to you after a short time is there anyone in this room? Jesus Jesus and the second group of people I want to speak to your Christians and this is going to take boldness tonight and I believe God wants us to respond to him. We're going to respond in worship, but I believe he wants a physical response tonight from his people. Will you admit before God tonight, not before me, before God tonight, that he has not been on the throne of your heart? The money has, the family has, the pride has, and whatever it may be. I'm not going to name all these things because you know. Before God tonight, is there something or someone else on the throne of your heart you want to say, God, come back onto the throne of my heart? If that's you tonight, I just want you to stand. Stand wherever you are. 
And it's got to take boldness. It's got to take courage to stand wherever we are. you want to take your place on the throne of our hearts, that you want to be king of our lives, and I thank you for your presence in this room. Praise you, Lord. Father God, as, as we respond to you as a church tonight, Father God, I pray that you continue to, to speak, continue to, to be with us. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Bless you. Let's stand as we worship. Amen.